You know, it's, it's just an absolute delight to see so many folks here early on Valentine's Day who have a real interest in making the world a better place. I believe that leadership well practiced in organizations create better organizations. I believe better organizations create better communities. And I believe better communities create better countries. And the journey that we've been on on MSCL for the last 15 years is one that is really encapsulated by a saying that I heard a few years ago by Doug Kennard, who used to be the uh, chairman of Campbell Soup. And he was talking about the two aspects of leadership. If leadership is truly about impacting outcomes, the first thing you need to do is understand what that in outcome is. But leadership is really about two things. It's really about being tough-minded and tender-hearted. And the genius is in the end. And the journey that you can go on with MSEL gets, as Ken and Dr. Cook dreamed at the beginning was, to get people in the heart and in the head. In the early times when this program was being put together, Ken would often say, there's plenty of MBA programs out there that are churning out great economists and lawyers, but are they teaching them to lead? And they weren't getting people in the head. They were getting them in the head, not in the heart. You know, when we woke up this morning and put on our badge of leadership, we took on an enormous responsibility, and that is we took on the responsibility of others. Leadership is about creating opportunities, creating space for people to perform their personal magnificence on a daily basis. Back in 1999, I entered the MSEL program after being two years at the helm of WD-40 company, and I realized and have all my life that I was consciously incompetent. I didn't know what I didn't know, and I came to MSEL because I wanted to sharpen my saw. I wanted to learn what I thought I knew, and I wanted to learn and confirm what I could know. And through MSEL, I learned some aspects of an organization that were very important. The first aspect was vision. In the initial classes, you learn about who you are as a leader, who, what your personal vision is, what your personal mission could be in life. And your life without vision is a mean, meaningless walk along a dark tunnel. A vision is a look at a mountain of where we wanted to go. So the first aspect of leadership is vision. Where do we want to go? You know, our vision at WD-40 Company is to create positive, lasting memories by solving problems in homes and factories of the world. Who would have ever thought that a can of oil was about creating memories? But that's really what we're about. The next part of a great leadership program is values. And so many organisations make the mistake of getting a few of their very smart executives together who happen to know everything. There was a few of those at Enron. <laughs> and put them in a room and come up with some really fancy words that mean nothing, put them in a frame and stick them on the entry wall in their foyer of their, of their office and say, these are the values of the organisation. Rarely do those leaders live the values and rarely do they talk about them within organisations. But values in an organisation, and this is something that we focus on in MSCL, are the written reminders of the only acceptable behaviour within an organisation. Values are like the riverbank of a river. The riverbank of a river ensures that the water runs from the mountain to the sea. Without the riverbank, that body of water would be a stagnant lake that would be a place where algae could form and things could die. The great thing about having values as the riverbank of your organisation is there's a lot of fun that happens on a river. If you can think about a river going from the mountain to the sea, it's not necessarily a boring place. But that bank keeps the river going in the right direction. That river has white water that causes some trouble. It has a place of solace that you can go to and be quiet. It has calmness. It has speed. 
but the values keep that operation going from the mountain to the sea. So in MSEL, you'll learn the power of values. You'll learn the power of learning. You know, I, lear I, I, I really realised a long time ago that there were three very important words in life, I don't know. <laughs> and if you're strong enough to be able to use them often, it's amazing how much you'll learn. And fear is the most dynamic disabler in life. You know, you only have to think about a deer standing in the middle of the road with a car coming at it with headlights on it. Now, now if that deer had any sense, it would get off the road. Because guess what? That car's coming at 65 miles an hour and, hey, goodbye deer. But because of the fear, the deer has stood in the middle of the road with those headlights coming and it's ready to die. And that's what fear does in an organisation. And the reason fear does that in an organisation is because most people use fear as an opportunity to punish people. So let's take fear out of organisations. Let's take mistakes out. I learned in, at the MSEL program that learning moments were much better than mistakes. <laughs> How many people in organisations do you hear running down the corridors yelling out, I made a mistake today? No, but you can have people in organisations that say, I had a learning moment. A learning moment is a positive or negative outcome of any situation that you can freely share with those around you to benefit them and others in the organisation. At MSCL, you learned the power of the learning moment. You learned that review was important, you learnt that the people within the organisation were important. One of the huge opportunities I had in life was when I listened to Ken in class one day and Ken was talking about, he was a misled university professor at Cornell, um, always been a rebel in his life, still is, always does things he shouldn't do. And uh, when he was teaching his class at Cornell, he used to give the final papers out at the beginning of the, at the, the class. And he's, the, the faculty, you know, came down heavy on him. What do you think you're doing? This is a, you're, you're taking out the academic rigour. You know, why the hell are you giving out the final papers? He said, give out the final papers. I'm going to give out the final papers and now we're going to spend the whole semester learning the answers. And I went, duh. <laughs> duh. Why don't we do that in organisations? In organisations, what do we do? We don't find time to clearly identify what a, an, an agreeable outcome is with our tribe members or our employees. We don't have time to interact with them and share with them how they're going and how they're progressing along that. We have this old review system where we would, on the th 364th day of the year, get a phone call from HR who'd say, have you done your employee review this year? And they'd say, oh, yes, I have. Yeah, no problem. Slam the door, open the, the, the door. Oh, I've got to get these done. I've got to get these done. You'd run up and, and, and then, then to really, we really got smart, some good IT guy brought in an automated system, so all you had to do was tick the boxes. <laughs> you know, developing people is not an exercise in box ticking. Developing people is an exercise in communication. What do I expect from you? What do you expect from me? What can I do to make your life a better place? What do I have to do to help you get an A? And from that, Ken and I wrote a book called Don't Mark My Paper, Help Me Get an A that we're both very proud of that now, I don't know, we've sold hundreds of thousands of copies and it's not for the money because we don't make any money out of it, but I, we're just so pleased that organisations around the world are using this book to help make the world a better place by, by helping their people be better. So, in a regular MBA program, you're going to learn marketing. You know, John, our marketing professor, is in, the, in the, the audience tonight. He just ran his class weekend, last weekend. I'm very fortunate. One of the people in his class is in our supply chain, Kevin Nolte, and with a little bit of luck, he'll learn marketing. Because we are a marketing organisation. I asked John this morning, did he do that? All I was told was he got a game of golf out of him. I thought, well, that's, maybe that's marketing. <laughs> but you're going to learn, but in MSL, you're also going to learn marketing. You're going to learn the basics of, of finance. You're going to learn statistics. You're going to learn all of the, the, the core elements of an MBA. But what you're going to take away is, you're gonna, not only going to take your head away, you're going to take your heart away. You're going to learn the power of people. Now, has this been successful at WD-40? Well, 
As I was driving in today, my cell phone went off and it was the Wall Street Journal, WD-40. Today hit its all-time high of its stock price ever in the company's history. That wasn't because of me, that's because of the 340, 50 tribe members at WD-40 that get up every day and perform servant leadership. We're committed to this program. We've had 18 people that we've fully funded through the program. We've got a million dollars invested in it. And the reason we do is because it makes a difference. So if you want to make a difference in the world today, if you think tough minded and tender hearted is important, if you think that leadership is about you serving others, you know, leadership is about the shepherd serving the sheep. It's not about the sheep serving the shepherd. If you think that servant leadership has three legs on its stool, which I do, servant leadership is about serving your customers, the people who buy your product every day. Can you create positive, lasting memories with them? It's about serving your people, the people who come to work every day. What right do we have to get in the way of people doing good work? What right do we have to get in the way of messing up people's lives? They do enough to mess it up themselves. And the sad thing today is 65% of people who went to work today are not engaged in what they do, which means they are either working aggressively or passively against the goals and the values of the organisation. Whose fault is that? Our fault as leaders. And the third part of the stool is we're there to serve our shareholders, the people who trust us with our investment. And as I said, at our company, if you'd invested in us 15 years ago, you would have had a 15-year record of 8% compounded annual growth rate of total shareholder return. We beat every indice over that time. At WD-40, our employee engagement number is 93%. 93% of people who went to work today at WD-40 are engaged because they believe they're doing meaningful work that's helping them and their, and their company and the community that they live in. And I didn't do that. Our people did that from the power they learned from the MSEL program. So my challenge to you is if you want to make a difference in the world, if you think that you still have something significant yet to do, and you do, if you can take the time to dedicate your life to being a servant leader, MSEL is where you want to come to. So with that, I'd like to introduce my, my friend and my mentor, Ken Blanchard, who's going to really tell you what it's all about. Thank you, Gary. Well, good morning. morning. Happy Valentine's. Margie read me a great thing today. She said, if you love somebody and they love you, it's like getting sunshine from both sides. Isn't that neat? <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's really, really great. Uh, uh, I don't know if all of you knew that you were here for a sales job for our program, but uh, we're going to also share some good stuff with you. But MSCL means it's a management of science in executive leadership. And Curtis Cook and I <coughs> came up with the idea years ago because I just, as Gary said, found in most MBA programs they were just dealing with people's heads and forgetting their hearts because that's where leadership really starts in your heart uh, because that's where you answer the question, are you here to serve or be served? Uh, and uh, they also weren't teaching anything about leadership. And we think leadership is a, is a transformational journey beginning with yourself. Uh, you're going to need to find out something about yourself. I think one of the reasons why there's a lot of people who think leadership is my way or the highway and they want to have control are scared little kids because they don't know who they are. And they're afraid to let go because they don't know what will happen. They don't feel good about themselves. It's really interesting. I wrote a book with Norman Vincent Peale. We, you know, as, uh, as Jim Collins uh, was saying, that you know, he found humility was one of the two characteristics of great leaders. He never in a million years would have guessed that. And, uh, and Norman and I said, you know, people with humility, a lot of people think that's a weak character. No, people with humility don't think less of themselves. They just think about themselves less. <laughs> and so part of leadership is really getting comfortable with who you are. Are you perfect? No. But do you have strengths? Yes, you do. 
Do you have some values? Yeah, we could help you get on those. If you, the clearer you are on yourself, the more you can help other people be magnificent. But if, you're, if you're, you don't know who you are, you're saying, so it all starts there with perspective. Then you can move to one-on-one. -on -one. Now you're building a, a sense of trust, which is so important in organizations. And trust is a big problem in this country, you know? Uh, people don't trust the government. People don't trust this and that. Why? Well, I think one of the problems is the press. I don't know if there's anybody here from the press, but we don't even watch the news anymore. You know, I was on a big news show here in San Diego a while back, and I came after the morning news, and I said to the commentator, did anything good happen in San Diego last night? I mean, you know, we got four million people. I bet somebody got home safely. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe took care of their kids and all that kind of thing. I said to Norman one time, he was 86 years old when I met him, and if you haven't read The Power of Positive Thinking, get it. He wrote it in 1952, but it's still an amazing book. I said, Norman, why isn't the press uh, talk about good news. He said, I'm so glad they don't. He said, if good news was news, there wouldn't be much of it going on. The only reason bad news is news is there's not much of it happening. I mean, they have to go so out of it to find things wrong, pick on that poor guy from Notre Dame, you know, I mean, for weeks, you know, about whether he knew her or not, and was she dead or not. I mean, who cares? <laughs> I mean, God, that's pitiful, see? But there's so many good news stories. And one of the things I love working with Gary is that's a good news story. I mean, look at that stock price, see? Because, you know, Colin says that great leaders have a both-and attitude towards people and results. It's not either or. See, and I wrote a book with Colleen Barrett, who is the president emeritus now of Southwest Airlines. The whole airline industry has lost money in its history. Southwest has made money every single year for 40 years. As Gary said, duh. You know why? And Gary and Colleen agree. You know who their number one customer is? Their people. If you take care of your people and create a motivating environment, empower them, they're going to get excited. Why do they have 93% engagement? You know? And if they're engaged, what are they going to want to do? They're going to want to take care of your number two customer, which is the people that use your products or services. And if they're excited and take care of them, what's that going to do? That's going to take care of your third most important customers, the stockholders, the owners, and all that. See, Wall Street has it all screwed up. They think the only reason for being in business is to make money. And then they think, well, customers are important. You know what you got to do. And what people are just movable parts. You know, they're not very important. That's such baloney. That's so ridiculous. And we just don't believe that, you know. And so... That's for the kind of things that, that we, we teach and emphasize because what we really want to do is create disciples to go out and what? Make a difference in other people's lives. How many of you would like to make a difference in, in the world before you're gone? How many would like to do it? Okay, how many of you have a plan on what you're going to do? <laughs> yeah, not all of you do, but some of you, that's great. But you know, you can make the world a better place by the moment-to-moment -moment decisions you make as you interact with other human beings. You know, somebody yells at you as you leave the house in the morning, you got a choice. You can yell back or go back in and give them a hug and tell them you hope their day is going to go a little bit better. Somebody cuts you off on the way to work, you know, you can got a choice. You can chase them and give them the finger. <laughs> or you can quietly send them a prayer and say, I wonder why they're in a hurry. Maybe there's somebody sick or, or what have you. And, you can really make a difference in people's lives. But the difference is to have a mind to serve, not to be served. But as Gary was implying, see, when I talk about servant leadership out there, uh, people think it's about the inmates running the prison or trying to please everybody. But they don't understand servant leadership. They don't understand leadership. See, there's two parts of servant leadership. There's the servant part, which is the vision, you know, the values, the goals and all. Leadership's about going somewhere. And if people don't know where you want them to go and what, how, what you want to guide the journey, what you want them to live, then what's the chances of them getting there? Very little. And as I go around the world, one of the biggest problems in organizations, they don't have a compelling vision. You know, you ask everybody, what business are you in? Every, you get a different answer from everybody. You know, I mean, he said they're in the memory business, essentially. You ask Colleen Barrett, you know what business Southwest is in? They're in the customer service business. They happen to fly airplanes. 
See, and everybody knows that. I mean, that's really a difference. You know, what the, what's the picture of the future, you know? You know, Gary's picture of the future, you want people to solve problems all over the country, you know, all over the world. And all, at Southwest, where their picture of the future is, they want to democratize the airways. They want every American to be able to be with a friend and a relative in a happy time or a sad time. Now, that gets you up in the morning. There's an interesting guy by the name of Simon Sinek who wrote a book called Why. You want to get that. It's really kind of interesting because he said there's three parts of organizations, the why, the what, and the how. And most people spend all their time on the, on the how and the what when they talk to people. But it's the why that gets people up in the morning. He said, how could Martin Luther King have gotten 250,000 people in the monument in Washington? They didn't even have the internet then to get people. If he said, I have a plan, you know? <laughs> You know, I have a dream, you know, which is what? A why, you know, that someday my Kyle will be in a country where, you know, people will recognize not by the color of their skin or their race or anything. You know, I mean, that's the why. Why are you doing things, see? And that's what the picture of the future is, the why. And then you put in values. What are values for? They guide your behavior. And without any values, you're really in problem. I, I just wrote a paper that I'm trying to get to Obama and, and the boys, because isn't it a mess in Washington? I mean, I don't care what, uh, what uh, party you're from, is it's a self-serving system. It's not a problem-solving system. And the reason is that we don't have a vision for this country anymore. We don't know what business we're in. Are we supposed to save the world for democracy? Are we supposed to be an economic model? I mean, what, what business are we in? And then what's the picture of the future? If we do a great job, what we'll accomplish? What are we trying to do? What's our dream for our country and our world? Now, the founding fathers had one, but we keep on putting all that back, you know, like you don't want to even mention anything about faith or values or all that kind of thing. Do we have any agreed upon values in this country? No. But suppose we did, for example, freedom of speech. Suppose that was a value, which I assume it would be. When a friend of mine, Dan Cathy, in a little radio station in Alabama, they said, what's your definition of marriage? He didn't attack anybody. He said, well, they're not open on Sunday. So what would he say? I believe in the biblical definition of marriage. So the mayor of Chicago, Buddy Obama, says you can't come in here anymore. If we had agreed upon values, Obama would have to say, Buddy, that's inappropriate. Freedom of speech is one of our values. This man didn't attack anybody. He gave his belief. You might not agree with that belief or whatever, but people are allowed to give their beliefs. So without values, it's the squeaky wheel that, 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 that does the, the damage, you know? So if you stand up for something, you know, you're against this, you're against that. It's crazy. We don't have a clear vision. Do we have goals that we're trying to accomplish? You know, like we'd like to do is this and all. I mean, you hear just, this is my program. I mean, I was in Europe during the debates I was so embarrassed, so embarrassed. Here's the President of the United States and a candidate calling each other liars in each other's face. My father was an admiral in the Navy. He thought, right or wrong, my president. That was a very big position to him, absolutely. I remember being on a program with General Schwarzkopf, and he opened up for questions. And when Clinton was president, somebody raised their hand and said, what do you think of our draft-dodging president? He said, he's my commander-in-chief. Next question. You know, and what those things should have been is not debates. Interesting guy in the National Prayer Breakfast with Obama and his wife sitting there. He said, there's too many damn lawyers in Washington because lawyers want to win. They're not to solve problems. What if those debates were problem-solving sessions where we had one on the economy, one on immigration, one on foreign policy, one on health care and all. And each candidate began to tell what they thought the issue was and what their solution would be. So they both presented. Then the next part of it would be for them to discuss what are the commonalities between our two approaches. And then the third is what could we agree upon here that no matter who won president, we would be able to support each other on, on that. I mean, wouldn't that have been a wonderful uh, thing? You know, sometimes I go, duh, like I'm coming from Mars, you know. Uh, 
But the point is, is without a clear vision, it says in the Bible, people without vision are what? Unrestrained. They perish. So we need to get a vision for this country. And that's the leadership part of servant leadership. And then you put your goals in there and all. Now the second part of servant leadership is the implementation part. And now what you've got to do is what? Turn the, the pyramid upside down. Now who do the leaders work for? They work for their people who eventually work for the customers. When Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, what was he doing? He was transitioning from vision to implementation. He had a real slow group, so it took him about three years to <laughs> get the vision. But when he finally realized he was going to be gone physically, he got down and washed their feet. And a lot of people think that if I become a servant leader, I lose my position and everything. Baloney, what did Jesus say after he washed the feet? The first thing he said is, you call me teacher, you call me Lord, rightly so. They didn't give that up. But just as I have done for you, do for others. See, and, but you can't serve people if there's nothing to serve. So if you take nothing out of this, what you need to do in your family in your department and all, is get a sense of a compelling vision. What business are you in? What's your picture of the future? What are your values? What are your goals? Get your people to agree upon that so now you have something to serve. And you, don't, you involve those people, as Gary said, it's not about him, but it's the responsibility of the leadership to make sure vision and direction are clear. Now you turn it upside down and you move from it's my responsibility to now what? They're responsible. That's what Gary was saying. They are the ones that have done it. But you have to create an environment that people can think they bring their brains to work, that you, you're there interested in learning opportunities, not beating them up, and all that kind of thing. And you're now I'm for them, and I'm going to do anything I can to help them win. See, and what do they do at WD-40? They sit down at the beginning of the year, go over their job responsibilities, and then each of the, they call them tribe members because they have a tribe culture, uh, sets with their tribe leader three to five observable, measurable goals. Why do you want them observable, measurable? So that other people can look at the performance and get the same evaluation that you. See, if you've got performance review that has people, you measure people on, you know, persistence or promotability or just, you know, come on, get a life. Nobody knows what that is, so you suck up the hierarchy because you know they're just going to have to screw a certain percentage of you. I mean, isn't it, you know, they say, you know, I want to build an engaged culture. Yeah, now we'll beat people up or Jack Welch, that was so bright. Let's rank order people and just make sure we get rid of 10% of them every year. That's a really nice philosophy, you know. I mean, Jack was a brilliant guy, didn't know anything about human beings. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, if people, oh, Jack Welch, come on, get a life. <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, because what you're really trying to do is help people win. Create an organization that, that people win. How many of you go out and hire losers? <laughs> you know, I lost some of our best losers last year. We got to hire some new ones to fill the low slots. <clears throat> no, you either hire winners or what? Potential winners. And what do you want to do with potential winners? You need to train them. You need to develop them. See? And so when everybody knows what an A is, and they set that up in the beginning of the year, now the WT tribe leaders now work for their people. What's their job? To get them an A. And Gary didn't mention it, but you know, if somebody comes to Gary, one of the top people, says this person's not, gonna, not working out, I think I'm going to have to fire them. The first question is, what did you do to help them get an A? If they can't document that they've done anything, broke all the meetings and all that, they have fired the manager, not the poor performer. I only had to do it a couple of times. And everybody says, oh, I guess we're supposed to help these people win. You know? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at the universities, you know? I mean, I was on the board of trustees at Cornell. The faculty hated me, you know? Because, oh my God, I said, we, we spend you know, millions of dollars recruiting probably the top 5% of the intellectual talent anywhere. I mean, it's unbelievable the talent that we get there. And now you bring them up there to sort them out. You know, we have professors there, mm -hmm. 
You know, average exam, the first exam would be 45, you know, just loosen these people up. You know, we had, we had like 10 suicides last year. I mean, unbelievable. Say, what's causing the suicides, you know? <laughs> I mean, I had a guy in my, my dorm at 800 in both of his college boards. Any of you know anything? You can't get any higher. I think they have, you know, different things. Was the highest? He went to Bronx High School of Science. His average marks in his first exams in engineering school was like 50. He never had that in his life. Guy jumped off to the bridge. You know, I mean, just couldn't take it. You know, because problem a lot of people who are really good students never play competitive athletics. That's the greatest training for going to universities, because they hit you all the time, and you got to decide whether you want to get up. And uh, so one thing about USD and all is I think they're really moving along great. In our program, we want everybody to get A's. We're not sitting here, mm, we've got them in this program here. <laughs> you know, come on. You know, the papers and everything are about your organization. They're not about going to the library and showing us how smart you are reading all these books. It's about how can this make a difference in your life? How can it make a difference in the people that, that you're doing because servant leaders are all about helping other people win. It's not about you. And if you do it, it's just amazing. You win too. I mean, WD-40, isn't that the highest stock price they've fed? W, you know, I was just with Colleen Barrett last week at a Servant Leadership Institute, you know. The damn Southwest, they keep on making money. Can you imagine? They even charge such a low price. I mean, how do they do that? You know? Well, one of the things that they do, which we also don't do in Washington, they use their people as their business partners. I mean, I don't think as citizens we're used as business partners. We don't even know half the information. You don't know what even to believe. Where a gal that works with us and around the house, she said to me a while back, she said, Ken, I understand we owe a lot of money to China. She said, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> She said, you know, if, if I knew and we knew how much and we had a plan on how we were going to reduce that debt, she said, I'd love to contribute to that in some small way if I knew. I think that's the way that people are in this country. If we ever knew, why aren't we part of the, the deal? Now, I was in Gary's country, Australia. Now it's much smaller in this country, but I have a good friend over there, Lindsay Fox, who's an old trucker, you know. And they had an unemployment problem a few years ago. And Lindsay, who's the top business guy, got together with the equivalent of the, the, our head of commerce in this country. And they took several weeks and went around to every town and city and everything and shared with people the data and said, you know, we need to create more jobs. Is there anything that you've been holding off that you could start and all because it, it, we really kind of need new jobs and all that kind of thing? And they came back with, you know, Several hundred thousand new jobs, just going to the people and saying, here's what we need. You know, can you help us? Here's the facts. You know, duh. <coughs> you know, and uh, you know, it's the same way with your people. You know, I see companies, they give financials, you know, are bad. We had a, in 2009, we had projected 60 million and we knew by February, if we did uh, 48, we would be lucky. And you know what we do every quarter? We have a meeting with everybody in our company and people from around the world come in on you know, computers and other kinds of things. And one of the first things we do is share the balance sheet. We even brought in somebody to teach everybody, including shipping, how to read a balance sheet. Why do you think they run? Well, because we have a gain sharing program that if we hit a 5% profit, we share you know, a good percentage of that for everybody so everybody can get maybe even up to a $2,500 bonus if we we do really well. We also have a give back program where we take 10% of our profit and we give it equally to all of our employees to give to charities of their, their choice. You know, they have to be 501C and they have to give to a project not to, and if they can't decide, we have a Blanchard for Others that picks out five charities that we support every year. So they're very interested. And Margie's brother Tom, who was the president at the time, he's up there with tears in his eyes showing them the facts and he said, we need your help. And the next month, uh, we were going to celebrate our 30th anniversary of our company. 
at the Hotel Dell. It's going to be a two-day party. We took the first day and brought in a, a large group uh, intervention company that works with a large group, and they broke everybody in our company into round tables into small groups. Half of the groups, their job was to uh, come up with ways that we could cut costs, and the other group was come up to a way we could increase revenues, because those are the two areas, of course, when you have. And I tell you, the stuff that came back from our own people, why don't we all take salary cuts? Why don't you stop backing 401k? Why don't we not give raises, you know, and all, I mean, all kinds of stuff, so that at the end of the year, we did 48 million, and we didn't get let go one person go because we implemented all kinds of things that they told us. They gotta be your business partners. Why are you thinking all the brains are in the, in the executive office? You know, I mean, none of us is as smart as all of us. What do you got them there for if you're not gonna use their brains? And I wanna tell you, like Harry does, I mean, you involve your people and ask them to be your partners, they kill for you, 93% engagement. That's pretty, pretty amazing and all. That doesn't happen by accident. It happens because you care, but that's that servant part of servant leadership, which is how do we really you know, make a difference there? And I want to tell you, it can make a difference in everything. And I want to tell you one, one story about, about that. And is, you know, because somebody, I'm working on this paper, so we're going to need government examples. Well, uh, a number of years ago, I uh, lost my license right before I was going on a big trip. And, <coughs> to Europe, and so I thought I'd better, you know, renew my license as a backup to my passport. But you all know we don't have to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles, but what is it, about every 10 years or something, they make you come in. And uh, so I said to the secretary, why don't you schedule, you know, three hours for me next week in the Department of Motor Vehicles, because that's about how long it takes them to beat you up. Uh, and <laughs> I used to think that they hired people uh, in the Department of Vehicles, they hated other human beings, you know what I mean? <laughs> because they had such great pleasure in telling you you're in the wrong line, you know, you fill out the wrong form, stupid. And, and our, our wonderful Mexican-American friends, they were rude to them and all. So, uh, so she set up a time for me to go over, and I went in. And the minute I walked in, I knew something happened. This woman charged me, and she said, welcome to the Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> she said, do you speak English or Spanish? And I said, English. She said, right over here. Guy behind the counter said, welcome to the Department of Motor Vehicles. How may I help you? It took me nine minutes to renew my license, including getting my picture taken. And I said to the woman taking my picture, what are you all smoking here? <laughs> I mean, this isn't the department I used to know and love. And uh, she said, haven't you met the new director? It's always a leader. It's always a leader. It's always a leader. And I said, where is the director? She said, right out there. And here's a guy. This, they have counters here when you come in, counters here. You know, you take your pictures back here. They welcome you. Guy's got a desk right out there in the open, no privacy. She said, there's the director sitting right over behind his desk. So I went over and I introduced myself to this guy. And I said, what's your job as the director of Department of Motor Vehicles? And he said, my job, this is the best definition of management I've heard in years, my job is to reorganize the department on a moment-to-moment -moment basis depending on citizen need. He had cross-trained everybody in everybody's job, including secretaries and bookkeepers who in the back of the house might not be mission critical at a point, but if there's a run on by citizens, they bring them out to fill lines to, to deal with people. Nobody could go lunch between 11.30 and 2. Why? When That's when come. the customers really come, you know. I was telling a story one time, and this woman came up, and she said, where is this place? She said, I was waiting in line for about 40 minutes, and I was about two people away, and the woman behind the counter said, it's coffee break. And she put the thing down, and they all stopped, and they're sitting there drinking donuts and coffee, and <laughs> the citizens are all in line, you know. And... Uh, so, I mean, I thought it was really pretty unbelievable, you know. And, uh, but it's interesting, about two weeks later, Dana, who was my secretary at the time, so this was a, quite a few years ago, and by the way, this guy is no longer there. You know, the bureaucracy ate him, but uh, the, uh, my secretary uh, had just turned 50, and she got this big motor scooter, see. 
she's going to bop around Southern California, you know, the last part of your life. And she never thought about a license for a motor scooter. You get them for a car. And I'm, no, I said, no, you got to get a license. So she goes to the Department of Motor Vehicles. And this woman types in her name, boom. She said, Dana, she said, according to the record, is that you're going to have to retake the written part of your automobile test in about three months. Why don't you take both tests today? And she said, test? I didn't know I was supposed to take a test. And this woman reaches across, pats her on the hand. She says, oh, Dana, with your driving record, never had a ticket in her life. I'm sure you can pass it. If you can't, you can always come back. So Dana went over and took the test, brought him back to this woman. She scored him. Dana fell one correct answer short of passing. So officially, she failed. This woman said, oh, Dana, you are so close to passing. Let me do something. Let me ask you one of the questions you got wrong and then see if rethinking it, you could get it right. Now, isn't that nice? But there's only two answers to each question. <laughs> So she said, Dana, you chose B. What do you think would be the right answer? Hey, you pass, you know. And so, <laughs> so I was telling this story one time, and uh, at the break, this bureaucrat came up. You can always tell bureaucrats. They got really tight underwear on, you know, <laughs> and they kind of walk a little bit like this, you know. And, uh, and he charged the stage, and he said, how can you tell that story? That woman was breaking the law. Your secretary failed. <laughs> so I went back to see my new buddy, see. And I told him the story, and he said, Ken, let me tell you one other thing. He said, when it comes to decision making, I want my people to use their brains before rules, regulations, or laws. He said, I guarantee if your secretary missed three or four questions, she wouldn't have given the same break, but she only missed one. She had a perfect driving record, and my person decided with somebody with that kind of record, why would you want to bring them back for one wrong answer? He said, I back her decision with my job. Would any of you like to work for him? Yeah. But so interesting, when you get things like that, rather than a hero, what, how is that person usually treated? Just like I was when I gave out the final exams the first class. You know, people want to get you out of the system. You know, I mean, what are you doing? You can't do that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's so interesting how people don't, don't want uh, wants you to do those kind of things. My, my God, you imagine running a joint organization. My dad was an admiral in the, in the Navy, and I said, Dad, to him one time, I said, how did you survive the Pentagon, you know? And he said, you know, being in the Pentagon was like two elephants fornicating. He said there was a lot of grunting and groaning at a high level, but nothing happened for years. And uh, so, and so, my dad, he was the one that told me break all the rules, see, but it's so interesting. The people at the university didn't know what to do with me because they would catch me doing some of this stuff, see? And my father taught me the stupid game, see? He said, because when some bureaucrat discovers you doing something that makes sense but isn't, quote, one of the rules, he said, don't look at him because you'll start to laugh. He said, so beat him to the punch, get your head down, and, and mumble a lot, you know? And so... He would do something, oh, God, I didn't know that was a policy. Shoot. <laughs> How could I be so stupid? Oh, God, I can't believe it, you know. No. And the person there, they don't know what to do with you because you've already acted like you're stupid, see? <laughs> and, and you're not looking, oh, God, you know, it is. Oh, that was stupid. I said, I can't. And they'd say, well, don't let it happen again. So he said, yes, sir. And he'd go and do it again because by the time he got caught again, the you know, person had changed jobs. <laughs> and, uh, and, oh, but... You know, because he said you had to do stuff like that to survive because there was so much stupid rules that, that people have that don't make any sense to anything. Uh, who is it, Gary, that has the, did you all have that? But there's one company I know that have a committee that's yeah. for stupid rules. Stupid policy. stupid policy committee. Isn't that a great, you know? <laughs> you get a group to say, you know, what are the policies that are stupid? And, you know, look at your policies. How many of them are stupid? And don't make any sense. Don't trust anybody, see? So, well, this is the kind of craziness that we talk about in the MSEL. So, I mean, I'm sure a number of you don't want to be part of this thing, you know? I mean, because this is really heresy. Uh, but uh, 
if you really want to make a difference in people's lives, you might want to look, look at this because it really is pretty powerful. They, they come for one three-day three weekend a month for, for uh, two years and one week each summer. And, and the cohort, the group, is as important as the professors, you know. We have a graduation dinner the night before everybody graduates, and I go around with a microphone and say, what did this program mean to you? And a lot of people cry. You know, and people from the outside who have been to those dinners, they say, what kind of program is this, you know? <laughs> I've never seen them crying at an MBA program, you know? I mean, well, because we get them at the high. But all the people who are in the program are graduated stand up, because there's a lot of them here today, you know, that just like to come back and get rejuvenated, so. Uh, So, and, and it's unbelievable, Gary and, and his company's put 18 people through the program. We almost have one or two every, every time. And that's their management development program. So that you get people thinking the same way and creating it. And it's just awful to run a company like that and get great results and great human satisfaction. You don't want that. <laughs> uh, so, but, uh, so it's, it's uh, really been a been a fun uh, journey for us, you know, that uh, when I turned 65 a few years ago, some of you have heard me say I was on the phone with my old buddy Zig Ziglar, who just died recently, and I'm losing all my buddies. Steve Covey died, and then about, oh, three weeks ago, Paul Hersey, who I developed situational leadership, died. So some of you say, you've lost weight. Yeah, I decided I'm going to at least give the Lord a chance uh, to keep me around here a little bit more. Uh, so I'm taking care of myself. And, uh, but... Uh, I was on the phone with Zig, and he invited Margie and I to the 59th anniversary of his 21st birthday. And uh, so I said, Zig, uh, uh, are you going to retire? He said, there's no mention of it in the Bible. He said, except for Jesus, Mary, and David, nobody under 80 made an impact. He said, I'm refiring, not retiring. Imagine if we had refirement homes. I've been down to retirement homes where everybody's sitting around dinner, you know, waiting to die, you know. What if somebody grabbed the microphone and said, the discussion question for the night at the tables is, you know? And uh, so uh, I'm going to be teaching this MACL uh, program until they take me up, you know? I mean, so is Margie and our people. And so uh, it's fun. So happy Valentine's Day. You know, go and give somebody a hug today and tell me, I'm the chief spiritual officer of our company, that's my title, and we got every faith and non-faith in it, and every morning I leave a message that does three things. One, I tell people who we ought to pray for and send our support, because people tell me about kids that are sick and parents and other things, and we have so much data on the power of prayer and support. Then I praise people of all the things I've ever taught in my life. If you said I'm going to take everything away, Blanchard, but one thing. I would hold on to catch people doing things right and accent the positive. I think too many organizations, all we do is catch people doing things wrong. You say, how do you know whether you're doing a good job? Nobody's yelled at me lately. <laughs> you know, no news is good news. And then I leave an inspirational message about something that I've heard or, or uh, talked and all. So uh, my message this morning was all about Valentine's Day and love and all those kind of uh, things. And I've been doing it for 15 years. Uh, now and so uh, go cheer people on they need it celebrate catch people doing things right have a wonderful life Woo!